Thank you, Betsy. Uh, crucial, crucial issues that are hard to to think about, but very important for everybody to think about. Um, and actually, we're going to move from violence in one context to violence in another. So, hang on. Um, as we uh, turn to Tyler, Tyler Giannini, uh, and Tyler, who is both a clinical professor and the co-director of the Human Rights Program here and the International Rights Clinic of the program, is uh, one of the world's leading experts uh, in the alien tort statute and litigation related to it. Uh, his uh, pioneering work actually set the precedence allowing litigation against corporations. Um, and he is also co-counsel uh, in litigation under this uh, domestic statute that seeks to hold multilateral uh, uh, organizations liable for their support of human rights violations in South Africa. And another that uh, challenges the actions of the president and defense minister in Bolivia related to a massacre in 2003. Um, his work is extensive, I don't know if it's big, it's extensive uh, in Myanmar and South Africa. It's also led him to do important work in Thailand, including uh, the organization uh, that he founded, um, the Earth Rights International Forefront uh, organization linking human rights and environmental protection. Um, and also work in Canada and Cambodia and Papua New Guinea and the United States. Uh, so Tyler Giannini is going to come speak with us about what strategies have worked and what strategies might work or might be needed in the future. Thanks, Dean Mino. It's really a pleasure to be here. And as you said, I'm here to talk and reflect a bit on the efforts in the human rights movement over the last 60 years. So a little bit shorter time period than um, Jonathan, um, but really to, to take a fresh look at this. And I think that's because one of the things that I really want to think about in going forward is because it's been 60 years, you often need a restart. And the key question for us as human rights practitioners, as clinicians, as advocates is, what does it take to move human rights forward? And so that's what I'm going to look at. And I'm going to look at it through a discussion about how human rights law and human rights movements should be put together. Um, it seems like a rather straightforward thing, but in fact, it isn't actually done very often. And so this is where we're headed, and I, I want to talk about that. So the first thing I want to talk about is some observations, and I've got a number of them to kind of give you some background. There's not everybody in this room as a human rights practitioner, so you may not know about the field. So you get a speed course in human rights. As I said, you really go back to post-World War II is where we start in the modern human rights era, looking at the wake of World War II and the horrific violence that came out of that, um, that era, in particular the Holocaust. That's not a surprise. But probably one thing that is a legacy of that period is that a lot of the human rights documents and a lot of the human rights law that we now depend on um, really is critiqued as being a start of a global domination of this field by the global north or the western countries. That it really isn't a global movement even though it has a universal peg to it. And that's been one of the lingering um, issues in the human rights movement for years. So that's the first observation, really a historical one. The second one is that not all fields of law actually can have a movement put to them with the term. So I think people could hear human rights law, that term means something, and a human rights movement also means something, but they're different. You don't often hear human rights law movement, that kind of doesn't ring right. But it's like civil rights in this sense. You have civil rights law, you have civil rights movement. So one of the things here is that the law is really about, and that phrase is about when you're applying that in a technical legal sense. The movement's something different. It's about political movements, it's about social movements, but quite different. And we're in a law school, so we often focus very much on the human rights law part of it, 
but less so on the movements. To kind of bring that home in a way that's real is there's been a lot of focus on Mandela's death in the last academic year. Mandela is not really about human rights law, he's about a human rights movement. And a lot of the things that people probably in this room associate with human rights is probably more about the movement side than the law side. If I asked you to t name one human rights case, you probably would scratch your heads. But if I asked you to define a human rights movement, you could probably come up with a few. That's the second observation. The third observation is that when you hear about the law, it might mean that the movement piece is actually in trouble. So we don't hear as much about civil rights movements now. We still hear a lot about civil rights law. What does that mean about the civil rights movement in this country? Where is it? I think with human rights, you still hear both, but more at the abstract global level or the meta level in terms of the movement piece. But that's the third observation. The fourth observation is that in the human rights field, there's very tried and true strategies that have developed over the last 60 years for human rights advocates and human rights lawyers. They're often the one and the same, but a lot of advocates are not always lawyers. And these strategies are primarily human rights litigation, going to human rights commissions, going to human rights courts, and naming and shaming, human rights reporting, um, human, such as the approaches of Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. Those are the tried and true approaches that everybody would know. The fifth observation is that in the global north, the primary strategies are actually those strategies, those two strategies that I just said, litigation and naming and shaming or reporting and documentation. In the global south, however, I would posit that there's a lot to be learned because the human rights law and the human rights movements are put together much more systematically, much more regularly. Not always, but much more regularly. And so if you look at a place like South Africa and you look at the effort to push for access to medicines around HIV AIDS, that was as much about the human rights law as it was about the human rights movement. And through that dual effort, they got success. And so the hypothesis here is that to keep the gains and to keep an issue moving ahead, you really need both the law and the movements. And you need a refresher that happens. And so what are the, the solutions? What are the big ideas? What can we do to maintain that in a regular way? Three solutions. The first is that as you heard Betsy talk about, often the person who holds the rights is forgotten. And the rights holder needs to be put at the center. That has to happen in a much more systematic way. That's really actually, it's crazy to say it in some ways. It seems absurd that human rights advocates wouldn't put the rights holder at the center. But they often forget civil society is often a proxy for rights holders. And there's this disconnect between the actual rights holder being put at the center of the equation and thinking about their perspective. And so that's, I think, one of the first solutions. The second is that we need to diversify the tried and true strategies. And this is something we've been working on in our clinic. We've been working with my co-director, Susan Farbstein, on that for years now. And what we've been trying to do is to push a dialogue into bringing community lawyering to be a third strategy that you bring into the equation of how do you sustain human rights advances. Litigation is important. Naming and shaming is important. Documentation is important. But so is community lawyering. We hear about it in other fields, but it's relatively new, extremely new in the field of human rights. And so that's the second thing that we need to do is to bring that sort of approach where other fields have done this for years and think about it in a transnational context. That's going to take work. It's a hard thing to think about, about how you do that in the clinic, but it's an important one. Another thing that he is in this second piece is the strategies of movement building, of community lawyering, are changing over time. 
and this ties into technology. And this is something that, again, working with Re Rebecca Richmond Cohen, who's in, in, the, in the audience here, we've been looking at the role of technology and film in human rights and figuring out how is that going to change the equation going forward. Documentation, critically important. Traditionally, interviewing was the method that was tried and true. True. And that would lead to the reports. But now, with film, video being ubiquitous, the methodologies of how you do human rights are changing, and that needs to feed into the way that we think about things. Film is part of that. Social media is part of that. But those are things that lawyers in increasingly need to think about just as deeply as they did about interviewing. And so the third solution is one that's relevant to clinics, I think, in this law school. And that's to bring this discussion into clinics. Because we know how to, to problematize the question of litigation. We know how to problematize documentation. If I go into a classroom and I ask students about the pros and cons of litigation, they know. They know that list. They know how to do that. They can do the same thing with documentation and interviewing. But if you ask them about community lawyering in the context of human rights, it's fresh. It's new for them. This may not always be the best approach, but they should bring the sophistication they bring to litigation, to documentation, to the effort of thinking about community lawyering. Because I would posit that the big idea is you bring law and movements together, and that's how you get advancement that's sustained on human rights. And so I close with really thinking about that good advocates really are both a lawyer's lawyer, somebody who can use the law and love the law, but also a movement lawyer. That's what a good human rights advocate is. Not everybody can be both, I know that. But if you can't be both, be one or the other and call somebody else to fill the gap. And then you have two people and you've started a movement. Thank you. <laughs>